Well, for more on the vaccines here in the U.S., I'm joined live via Skype by Dr. William Moss. He's the executive director of the International Vaccine Access Center and professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rochelle, for having me. So do the benefits of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine outweigh its risks for use in people aged 18 and older? That was the question the FDA panel had to answer in order for the vaccine to move ahead in the process. Talk about the initial findings in Johnson & Johnson's vaccine trials and studies. Yes, well, I, I think the Johnson & Johnson vaccine clearly uh, reaches that mark. Um, this is a different type of vaccine than the Pfizer Moderna vaccine. Those are messenger RNA vaccines. This is an adenovirus vectored vaccine. So just over one year into uh, into this pandemic, we now have uh, you know two uh, two different, broadly different types of vaccines uh, be uh, being considered for emergency use authorization or granting having an emergency use authorization. So what the the, the large phase three trials uh, showed, and it enrolled almost 45,000 individuals across eight countries. Um, here in the United States, we saw 72% vaccine efficacy uh, against a moderate or severe COVID. There was 64% efficacy in South Africa, where we know is that variant of concern. Uh, so we're seeing lower efficacy than we saw uh, the strikingly high efficacy with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. But I think what's really important is we saw 86% efficacy against severe disease here in the United States, 84% efficacy in South Africa with that variant. This vaccine no doubt uh, prevents severe disease. And we saw consistent results across ages and across race, uh, different race, racial and ethnic groups. And how does it stack up against those existing vaccines when it comes to things like, like cost and distribution and storage? Yes, what's really uh, uh, nice about this Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and, and this is really important for the global market, is that the adenovirus vectored vaccines uh, like J&J &J are much more heat uh, stable. So this vaccine can be stored at refrigerator temperatures for up to three months, does not require that ultra cold storage uh, freezer temperatures that we that are needed for the messenger RNA vaccines. So this vaccine is gonna be able to, uh, to get out in, into remote rural areas that don't have that capacity uh, for ultra cold storage to pharmacies uh, and other locations where this vaccine can be distributed. And the other big thing is that this will receive emergency use authorization authorization, uh, hopefully as soon as tomorrow, uh, for a single dose. Uh, the, obviously, the, the efficacy is a little lower than what we saw with two doses of the Pfizer-Moderna vaccines, right. but we're, we're, we're expecting an emergency use authorization for a single dose. So then how does this actually fit in with the current distribution plan with the other vaccines in the mix as well? Yeah, I think uh, that these, this vaccine will also be distributed to states and to pharmacies uh, as with the other vaccines. Again, they won't require that, that ultra cold temperatures, um, but we are gonna have to uh, modify our, our data tracking systems, for example. We'll need to keep track of each vaccine and how many individuals are being uh, are receiving this vaccine because obviously a quote fully vaccinated individual with the Johnson and Johnson is just going to be a single dose. We're now counting fully vaccinated as two doses uh, of the of the messenger RNA vaccines. So then I want to talk about this concept of vaccine pooling. Would that work in the case of COVID vaccines? And give it a definition for those who aren't familiar, please. Yes, this this vaccine pooling, uh, where where vaccines are, uh, are where where the purchasing is is, uh, is spread across uh, across different vaccines, and where we uh, where there are mechanisms to ensure that uh, other countries can act and and low income countries in particular can get as access to vaccines. So we're seeing that with the COVAX facility uh, in terms of getting vaccines uh, out to people who really need them. And in terms of those who need them, obviously we saw nursing homes were among the facilities who bore the brunt of the virus. You also have a disproportionate impact on minority communities as well. What's changed from the start of the pandemic to now? Yes, well, the, as, you, as you know, the nursing home, homes were hit really hard early in the pandemic and the vast majority of deaths were occurring in those populations. Um, and so, 
those those populations were targeted uh, and prioritized for early vaccination. So we're seeing a remarkable drop in, in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in people uh, residing in uh, long-term care facilities. And that's as a consequence, I believe, as, as getting those populations vaccinated. Now, we still need to do much better uh, with disadvantaged and underserved populations, and we need to be able to move vaccines out in those communities. We need to build trust in those communities so that those communities uh, accept the vaccine and we can get uh, high vaccine coverage uh, there because of the disproportionate burden. All right, thank you for your insights, Dr. William Moss there, Executive Director of the International Vaccine Access Center and Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health.